Welcome back everyone. Uh, another live stream here at the Australian Reptile Park. It's a very, very wet Tuesday. We thought we were going to be doing this demonstration outside, but with all the rain we've decided to bring the animal inside uh, and also too, which gives us a nice backdrop as we stand inside our lost world of reptiles. So this is a pretty amazing little facility where we have a whole range of exotic and native species on display for all you guys to enjoy, which no doubt you'll be able to do when we open up again. Now yeah, today, I'm going to be honest, Jake, Jake the Snake was meant to be doing today's live stream, but he's at home instead waiting for his NBN to get fixed, so he probably won't be back for three months. But anyway, uh, so he's not here, I'm going to jump in and do today's live stream instead. Uh, yesterday we were talking about anacondas, some really large big snakes from South America. Now we're not really travelling too far in the world uh, to uh, look into the next animal we're going to be seeing as we travel a little bit further up into the Americas again uh, and the southern part of the United States and of course Mexico as well is where you might find this next particular lizard that we're about to show you. Now this is a venomous lizard, it's one of the coolest species that we have here at the park and I'm going to grab it out now. Uh, but what I'll show you first, just we're going to put the animal down here. I've actually got a little bit of food to give it as well today. They're kind of just coming out of their winter brumation period. So this will be one of the first feeds this animal's had in a little while. So I've just got a little display set up so the animal can come out, be nice and relaxed. I've got some rocks and uh, some, tent uh, some logs there as well. But yes, yeah, so I'm about to show you probably one of the more unique lizards that calls the reptile park home. Now, of course, I'm talking about one of our healer monsters. Now, typically, he's pretty relaxed, I've got to be honest, uh, but today he's actually got the smell of food. Um, because I am going to be feeding him in a second, we might even do it quite soon so he relaxes a little bit. But because I've brought out food and he's sticking out that tongue quite vigorously, uh, he's reacting to my movements a lot more than he would usually do. Usually I would say this animal, this is Julio, would be quite relaxed, but today he is a little bit jumpier than normal and that's because he thinks he's going to get fed in a few seconds so you kind of got to be on your toes a little bit um, usually as i said he is a very very relaxed lizard now this is a healer monster um, as i said this animal is native to uh, can you see that there caitlin on the camera S uh, southern united states places like uh, Arizona and Mexico, but also found in Mexico as well. And what we call these animals are venomous lizards because they are. Um, they have venom glands in their bottom jaws there. Uh, they've got really strong muscles in the top part of the jaw. And when they bite down on prey, they will the, their sharp teeth will obviously serrate the skin and then they'll start to induce the venom from that. So this is one of the world's what we call to, there, look, there's more venomous lizard species we know of now because monitor lizards are considered venomous, but uh, your healer monsters and your beaded lizards were for a very, very long time considered uh, the two true venomous lizard species. Well, actually, there's more than that because uh, beaded lizards are now four separate species, whereas your healer monster is the one separate, separate species. It's the only true venomous lizard found uh, in America, whereas the four species of beaded lizards are all found in Mexico, but they also have the healer monster as well. Now, healer monsters spend a large majority of their time underground. Here we go, we'll give them a little bit of food there. Oh, oh, there we go, get the tongue out. I'm not sure if you can see that too well because he's decided to turn around. I'm trying to actually keep him off the sand a little bit, but uh, he's actually very slow. There he goes, he's got it now. He's using his tongue and he's starting to swallow that food. Now, it doesn't look like very much food today for a Gila monster, but in saying that, they have a fairly slow metabolism and they don't have to eat all that often. But what I was mentioning before is they do spend approximately 90% of their time uh, of their lives underground. And that's because the I guess the habitat that they're found in is quite harsh, quite dry, but also extremely warm as well. So they avoid those really hot, warm peaks of the day, staying underneath the ground, and they are quite active at night. So generally they'll come out in the early morning and bask and warm up their, I guess their core body temperature, and then they'll start to forage and move around at night. And what they feed on in the wild, or anything really they come across, so small birds, small mammals, and of course they'll raid egg uh, nests as well, picking up any eggs, maybe from a ground-dwelling bird species. But they don't have to eat that often. In fact, they do spend a large majority of the year where they don't feed, feed at all, uh, particularly in the cooler months. And then they'll start to come out again in around March as the day daytime temperatures start to increase. And then around April, May, the male activity will increase quite a bit as they start to move around looking for a female Gila monster to mate with. Now, a lot of people um, that see Gila monsters interacting with each other and they believe that they're mating, they're actually seeing two males combat. 
So male healer monsters will combat quite vigorously where they'll tie their bodies together basically, almost looks like a wrestle motion. And the dominant male then from that point will be the one that the females will be more receptive to. And then the females and the, and the male and the female will mate um, in a small little burrow. Once they've mated, you're looking at around a, um, a fairly small gestation period before she'll deposit the eggs. But then you're looking at around five months incubation time. And a lot of those records are mainly known from captive lizards, but five months in the egg. And a female Gila monster will lay anywhere between four, maybe six uh, eggs, sometimes even a little bit more than that, up to eight, but they are quite rare. Now, uh, a few years ago, there was pre something pretty exciting in the science world where one of the first Gila monster nesting sites was discovered. Now, how it was discovered is quite interesting. What happened is there was some housing development, they were digging in the backyard, uh, and they actually dug up a Gila monster nest, which is pretty cool, because that's something that hasn't seen uh, very often. Now, we're gonna give him the last little bit of food here. I only bought two, because as I said, only small amounts of feed. Now, if you notice the Gila monster, he would have stuck out his forked tongue. They have a bifurcated tongue, just like a venomous snake, or sorry, any snake species. All snake species have a forked tongue or bifurcated tongue. And that's the same as our monitor lizards that we have here in Australia. Oh, I'm gonna come down a little bit. So our monitor lizards do have a bifurcated tongue as well, so those forked tongue. And then you, there's a lot of similarities in terms of relationship between the monitor species from Asia, Africa and Australia, and also to the Gila monsters or the Gila germs like we're looking at right now. Now, one other thing you'll notice, a lot of people think they're, they're, oh, look, look, they're probably a little bit scary looking, but most people are never gonna encounter a Gila monster in their life. Stop looking at my fingers, they're not food. Um, but also, see those, those <laughs> very cheeky. See those live raised scales along the back here? Uh, if you actually feel them, what they are is what we call osteoderms. So underneath the skin, they've got this little bony plate. Uh, and then obviously it's aids in protection against potential bites from other lizard species or maybe other Gila monsters, but also to predatory species as well. And that's very similar to the back that you'd feel, on, again, one of our monitor species here in Australia. Now, because as the daytime temperature in this part of the world is starting to increase, we're noticing our Gila monsters becoming more active. And this is probably the most food motivated I've ever seen this lizard. Generally, he is so relaxed, but because he's responding to the scent of the food, you can see he's just active, looking for it, and he's actually trying to even bite down on the plastic here because he can see the movement from my fingers, and he's responding to that. Now, <laughs> so what I said before, that what we call venomous is, and they are, and if he was to bite me today, obviously bite down quite hard, it would open my skin with his teeth. I'm actually going to use my glove today. I know this is funny, but I actually, just in case, I'm going to use the glove to pick him back up because he is trying to, um, to have a little nibble, which is something I don't really enjoy too much. Now, if he was to bite me, um, and obviously sort of the skin would open up from his sharp teeth, and then he would induce venom from that, I would experience severe pain, nausea, and the sad thing is, uh, for me, there is no anti-venom treatment or anything like that. So if I had to go to hospital, uh, they'd be monitoring my symptoms, but also to it would more so be about pain treatment rather than any other treatment. So it's meant to be quite painful. Most of the bites that have happened have happened in captivity, so keepers or, or private hobbyists with healer monsters that have been bitten, and they do say the bite is quite excruciating. Now there's, I think, one recorded death attributed to healer monster in America, but the records of that are very, very dodgy. So it's probably more likely there's never been a recorded death from healer monster uh, in the wild. So whilst they do look quite fearsome, um, they actually are quite a sluggish little animal and they're not a species that's really inclined uh, to definitely attack people or anything like that. In 1959, there was actually a movie called, I think it was called Giant Gila Monster, and basically it was about this Gila Monster thing that was going around America trying to, this giant Gila Monster, of course, uh, killing people, but that was a movie um, back in the 1950s. They don't behave like that too much at all. They are definitely one of the coolest reptiles we have here at the Reptile Park, and I've been very fortunate enough to work with them for a long time, and I've spent a bit of time over in the States actually looking for Gila monsters in the wild. They really are a spectacular uh, looking beast. Uh, obviously, because they are a reptile, like all reptile species, they do rely on the sun to warm up their body. They're what we call ectothermic creatures. So when they come out and bask in the early morning, they'll be warm up their internal body temperature, and then they can be active again at night. So I wouldn't say that they're fully nocturnal because they will come out in kind of crepuscular kind of habits, uh, but generally when you will find them active is cruising around at night. And whilst they look 
quite sluggish. You get one on a really nice warm night of 30 degrees, particularly in around August when you get those hot, hot, wet nights in that part of the states where they inhabit, that's when you'll see them at their most active. Now what I'm thinking I might do, if you guys keep the camera on, I might get him back into his box and then we can ask some questions if that's okay. I'd love to keep him out, but um, so I can focus on your questions, I might put him away so I don't have to worry about any bites or anything like that. We'll just ask a quick question while he's still out. Yeah. Are they, is that the only colour that he'll come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they can, the, the beaded lizards can be quite dark, um, but in terms of healer, monster, that's pretty much what they look like all the time. They get a couple of different pattern types, but really uh, that coloration is quite um, typical of healer monsters. What's the difference between a male and a female? Uh, really hard to tell the difference. In, uh, uh, honestly, it is, there is a little bit of difference in head shape um, around the tail base, but I mean, really, the best way to tell the difference is behaviour, but also to, through an x-ray. So it can be quite difficult. We had, we got two now, we had three males, um, and we went through that process of trying to sex them, so we identified their sex via x-ray. Uh, but yeah, it is quite difficult to tell the difference. Uh, in saying that, in their, when I mentioned behaviour before, if you introduce two males together, they will combat, particularly um, as the temperatures start to increase. So you kind of know straight away you're looking at two boys, but it can be quite difficult to tell the sex just visually between a boy and a girl. One way I knew that he was a male before is when he first came out, he was actually starting to avert his hemipenes. So uh, a lizard like that has two penises, so hemipenes we call them. Uh, he was actually averting them when he first came out. So I definitely know he's a male, because a female wouldn't have them. Not that like that anyway. How big would is can Julio get? Yeah, so he's, he's not fully grown. Um, he's not going to grow much more than he is. They're not a massive lizard. They don't grow as large as some of the beaded lizard species. They do grow quite large, but really you're looking at an adult lizard there. He might get a little bit longer in his lifetime, but that's pretty much it for Julio. How long do they live for? They can live for a fairly long time, particularly in, capti in captivity. So they've been known to live over 40 years. So Julio, I think, 26 or 27. I used to work with another one that was well into her 30s when, and, she, and, and she was still going, she's still kicking on pretty strong. Um, so they live for an extremely long amount of time. And that's not really rare in the reptile world. We know reptiles can live, let's come on behind me, but lizard trying the to The forest dragons forest saying dragons hello. The uh, reptiles can live for extremely long amounts of time. If you look at Galapagos tortoises or even something like saltwater crocodiles, well past 100 years. Um, so yeah, no surprise they can live well into their 30s or 40s. Are they under threat in the wild? Yeah, they're considered threatened, and that's mainly due to habitat loss. Um, unfortunately, in that part of the states, there is a pretty severe decline of a lot of endemic species, and most of that is through habitat loss and habitat destruction. Um, in some populations, you can still find them in pretty good numbers, but they're certainly a species in need of conservation. One cool thing is, actually in America, they were one of the first species, venomous species, to ever be protected, which I think is quite cool. Um, so they are protected, of course. What kind of um, prey would they hunt in the wild? Yeah, so anything, small mammals, uh, birds, other reptiles, they love eating eggs. So you can imagine you have a ground dwelling bird species, healer monster moves around, comes across the eggs, scares off the bird, uh, and then predates on the eggs. And we do it quite, quite often feed them eggs, so small little quail eggs. Um, we also feed them small mice, at times small chicken, uh, small bits of chicken I should say. Um, we try and keep their dairy, uh, diet fairly varied, but in saying we don't feed them that often because they do have such a so slow metabolism. Uh, and this particular lizard hasn't had a feed now for quite a little while. And that's why you could see how <laughs> motivated he was for food today. That's the first time I've ever seen him try and bite me, that's for sure. Where does the name Gila Monster come from? Yeah, Gila Monster is named after the Gila River in New Mexico. So uh, a lot of people, when they see the name pronounced, because it starts with a, a G, uh, the G is soft, so it's actually Gila Monster, not Gila Monster, as some people might say, but the name comes from the Gila River in New Mexico, which is Gila River or the basin uh, in New Mexico. All right, Dan, last one. Tell us a bit more about other venomous lizard species. Okay, so there's been plenty of research done on venomous lizards, and this is only going to continue as we find out more and more and more. Um, but really, originally, we used to talk about the Gila monster and the beady lizard as the true venomous lizards. Uh, a lot of research happened in terms of Komodo dragons and then other monitor lizards as well, but that'll probably expand uh, or continue to expand and we'll find more and more lizards what we consider venomous but um, this is a lizard that could cause harm particularly if they bit a keeper uh, so but I guess you could have the same thing happen with the Komodo dragon to be honest but a lot of the damage will be done just from their sharp serrated teeth I certainly would not and, and the thing with healers is when they bite they tend to grab on and they don't really want to let go
All right, Dan, thanks so much. That was great. Thanks, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a little bit jumpy today, but uh, he's not usually like that. But I hope you enjoyed it anyway, seeing up close one of our beautiful Gila monsters. Keep tuning in through the rest of the week. Tomorrow we'll ramp it up again with Elvis the Saltwater Crocodile, a couple other videos towards the end of the week. I hope you're enjoying these live streams. Uh, we'll keep them coming to you guys at home. Uh, stay safe, stay well, and I'll see you at the Reptile Park soon, all right? See you later. Bye.